I don't care what anybody says we're starting. Get the camera. Get the camera. Ready to go? Okay. Okay, people, we're starting a training class. If you're interested, pull up a chair. Okay. Don't need a PA system. Okay, my name is Jim Bielozak. I'm a radio enthusiast, probably like you are. And uh, the idea of this class is many, many months ago we did a survey and it turned out that... Training class for uh, basic radio theory troubleshooting and repair is starting in the hall. So uh, if you're interested in that class, it would be an excellent time to go in the hall and uh, take a seat. Thanks. Okay, don't catch up. Okay, so we did it. We did a, uh, a survey and found out that uh, people really needed some basic training in, in radio. Uh, and the whole story was people recap the radio. The radios don't work. Uh, why don't they work? Well, I think we went all the way back to the beginning and said if you don't understand how the radio works, then you recap it. And when you're done with it, it doesn't work. You still, you still don't know what to do. So we want to go all the way back to square one and say, let's put this training course together, start with some block diagrams that describe how the radios work. So we talk about the individual pieces of the radio, and then we talk about the schematics, go through the schematic, talk about how the radio works, point out various failure mechanisms, what can happen if, what to look for, etc. And we have a couple of examples over here. We have a Helicraft S120. We'll go through and we'll talk about the components in there. And, uh, and basically get people to have some basic understanding of it. And this, this understanding of how something works what applies to everything if you're trying to fix it. If you're trying to fix a radio, you understand how it works, you can do it. You can fix your refrigerator the same way, you can fix your car, you can fix your lawnmower, whatever you know how it works. So, this is the, uh, this is the schematic, the block diagram of the uh, S120 helicopters. And uh, it's a simple 5-tube radio, uh, and it starts off if we're going to do anything with the radio, uh, probably have to talk about tubes first. Uh, if you go through a radio and find out your tubes are okay, at least you have a good starting point. Uh, the next place to start is in the power supply. And we'll get into the schematic on the, on the next sheet. But uh, basically what happens is we have our AC line coming in and we can easily check the output of the power supply by putting a voltmeter on and checking it. And if you look at the, man the uh, material, a lot of the a lot of the manufacturers put out their own material like this. Uh, we have examples of some older radios too, shortly. But uh, this will give the, uh, the information as to how many, how much uh, uh, voltage the uh, power supply should be putting out. But anyway, so basically we start off with the power supply. Uh, the only signal, uh, I've, I've shown a, an RF amplifier here. The S120 doesn't have an RF amplifier. Uh, more expensive radios, more elaborate radios will have an RF amplifier. Sometimes they'll have two RF amplifiers. Uh, I just put that in there just for the sake of completeness. This radio, uh, the, power, the antenna goes directly into the, uh, to the first detector and oscillator. And what happens here is this signal coming in, and I'm going to use an example of, of uh, 1,000 kilohertz or 1 megahertz signal. This signal comes in here. And the idea is to get that signal down to our IF frequency, which is 455 kilohertz. And the way that's done is this, this block will inject a signal at 1.455 megahertz. And, and what happens then, this, this, this detector, this uh, uh, demod de de detector or demodulator, will mix this incoming signal at one, 1 megahertz Oh, uh, 1,000 kilohertz with the the uh, injection oscillator 1.455, and we get a sum and a difference out of out of this out of this uh, detector. And th the difference, if you take the the 1.455 to 1 megahertz coming in here, would give you 455. You also have some other products. You have the incoming signal coming in here, 1 1 megahertz, 1,000 kilohertz. It won't go through here. This is 455. You have the other products, you have the, uh, the one, 1 plus 1 1.455, and that's 2.455, that's not going to go through there. So the only signal that's going to come through here will be the uh, 455. And the reason, the reason you want to do this is because you can take a small circuit like this and have very, very high gain on it. And, and that's basically the definition of superhead. Otherwise, you would have to provide this huge gain over 
the entire broadcast band, which is virtually impossible to do. So, and you also achieve great selectivity by doing that, but you're just looking at this narrow band of 455 kilohertz to be able to, uh, uh, to handle the signal. The signal comes out of here and goes into uh, this detector. And the detector provides two things. What the detector does is will take the, the information off of the signal, off this incoming signal, and will provide audio to the audio amplifier, and also provide a DC signal back here uh, to, uh, as a uh, AGC to control the gain of these other, these other uh, stages. Otherwise, what happens is a very, very strong signal coming in here, what will happen is overload all these circuits. So as a strong signal comes through here, this develops a higher voltage, higher negative voltage, which will come back and reduce the gain of these other stages. And of course, the audio amplifier kind of speaks for itself. Uh, I got to stop at this point and, and ask people if they have questions or do I need more explanation? One thing, and I go too fast. I need some feedback. Sure. The difference in the mix of the difference is 455. Yes. So why is it 455? Why not 450? Some of them are 456, but why not 500? Why not? It, 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 it almost doesn't matter what it is. Some radios, older radios had some weird ones. And I don't even know, 210 or 270 or something. Yeah. I'm not sure how these frequencies came about. Uh, there's probably some history behind it, but I'm not a historian, so all I know is we have 455 kilohertz IFs. Uh, the, a lot of the other, uh, the other equipment, like FM, will have 10.7 megahertz IF. I'm not sure exactly how those things came about. But uh, 455 is kind of the standard. Yeah. And, and it also doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be exactly 455, it turns out. It could be a little bit one way or another. The other thing I want to mention too is this, this, this circuits here in front that are tuning this, this, uh, this antenna are, are, are keyed, they are uh, synced in with the oscillator. So as the, as the front end of the radio is tuning to, to, one, kilohertz, to uh, one megahertz or 1,000 kilohertz, this oscillator is trying to get a signal in there at 1.455 kilohertz. So they're, they're, they're synced together. Question? The power coming out of the second detector, how, how does it um, decide how much the voltage, like it's cutting it down in the first and the IL? Uh, okay, uh, that will show up on, on the next one. When I, when, I flip the, oh, when I flip the chart and go to the schematic, you'll see that. You'll, okay. what, what you'll see is the incoming signal comes out of the the detector goes through a diode and produces a, a voltage. That voltage uh, goes through a, uh, a resistor and a capacitor, and the resistor and the capacitor will feed the AC off the, uh, the uh, envelope, the, uh, the intelligence, the sidebands, off to the uh, audio amplifier, and the DC will go off to the AGC. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll see that in more. Okay. You'll see that more explicitly when we go to schematic. All right. Any basic general questions? Let me flip the schematic here. Okay, now we we'll really get down to some information. And, you know, if you, if you took a look at that for, at the first uh, look, you'd say, well, it, it's really a bunch of, bunch of stuff on there. But if we break the thing up and we take a look at it, what we'll see is that in here, we have a bunch of coils. This, this radio, it's a five-tube radio, but it also has other bands in it. It has bands up to 30 megacycles. So there, there, are, there are four sets of coils in here that go from broadcast all the way up. And as the, the signal comes in, each of these circuits is tuned by this capacitor here. So if you have the one megahertz coming in, when you turn the dial to one megahertz, these capacitors and all these coils will be resonant, and through this capacitor, feed this signal out into this first, first converter or detector. Now, as I said earlier, these, these, this, this whole circuit uh, in, the, uh, in the antenna side is, is linked in with the capacitor uh, in the oscillator side because they're on the same shaft. You get the capacitors uh, on the same shaft. And as you turn, as you go to one megahertz, one uh, thousand kilohertz on here, you get 1.645 on here. Uh, in terms of troubleshooting, what that says is if you want to know if this is working, you take another radio, another five band radio, tune it to 1.455 megahertz on your dial, and you should be able to hear this oscillate. Maybe you have to put a little wire over there. Uh, we need some more handouts. Larry? Oh, 
Everybody have a hand now? Okay. Okay, so as I was saying, these two, this circuitry here is basically synced in with this by the shaft on the, on the capacitor. So we have a signal coming out of here at 455, at, well, the signal coming out here at 455 kilohertz, going into this 455 kilohertz transformer. It's hard to see over there, isn't it? That's all right. Well, I don't think you can squeeze in a little bit more to be able to see that. If you're interested in seeing it, you can squeeze in a little bit more. Okay, so we have a signal coming out of 455 kilohertz. That signal will, will then go through uh, the IF amplifier. Again, the IF amplifier is a pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward unit. Uh, you have a signal coming in and a signal come out with the second, second IF transformer. Uh, and to answer your question about the, uh, the signal, how does a signal come how do you get the AGC off and how do you get the audio out? That happens right here. This is basically a diode, and that uh, diode, uh, there's a whole loop through here through this capacitor and these, these resistors. And there's a time constant in there. And that time constant is chosen such that uh, it can handle the in highest uh, frequency incoming audio. In other words, about five or 10 kilohertz. And what will happen is the audio will come off of this capacitor through your volume control right over here into your audio amplifier. And the DC will, see this is going to be DC, the negative DC will go back here and it will bias this tube. So the stronger the signal here, the more negative this will be, which will start to turn this tube off. And that's how the AGC works. Okay. Um, I probably should have talked about the power supply here first, but we'll talk about the power supply now. Uh, the power supply is simply just this, 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 this diode, and we have a number of capacitors in here. So the, the, uh, the diode, again, will push, it's, a, it's a half wave rectifier, which basically says, you know, each positive cycle of the incoming power, you'll end up with a, with a, a uh, chunk of, of power coming in. And then when it goes negative, it's going to be shut off, then you have another chunk of positive. Well, these capacitors will integrate all those uh, individual energy bumps and hopefully come up with a nice smooth amount of DC. If these capacitors start to go bad, then you end up with more ripple on it and you end up with a wobbly sound in your radio and eventually the power supply voltage goes down and then things really go downhill. Do you need a, a, a handout? What about the uh, caps and the IF transformers? Okay. I was going to get, I get to oh, those. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. Uh, I'm just walking okay. back and forth. Okay, I'll, I'll, let me jump ahead to that. The caps and the IF transformers, uh, especially the, the, the radios that have the small ones that are about an inch square and about that high, uh, the, the, uh, the capacitors are made of, of two pieces of metal, silver, silver plated metal, with a piece of micro resistor. What happens is the, uh, the silver from the capacitors migrates into the silver causing uh, the dissipation factor, causing the, the, uh, the insulator to not to be an insulator anymore. And the, the gain of these transformers goes way down, almost to zero. And the way, the way you end up checking that, uh, and I do that typically, is uh, if, I, if I suspect one of these transformers is bad, you shut off all the power, put a signal into the input of the IF transformer, and measure the output of the IF If you find out it's bad, you extract the thing, open it up carefully, Bend those, those, those plates. Sometimes there's a rivet on the bottom. You use a Dremel tool and drill out the rivet. Open, take those, take those, those plates away, throw away the mica, and put a, I think it's a 120 pump capacitor. I think that's the right value. Um, but if you look at them, what I also do too is I will measure, if, you, if, you, if it's out, you can measure the inductor. You measure the inductor, and you know what the output frequency should be 455, you can figure out what the capacitor is. I, and I believe it's 120 puff. And you get the nice small ones that fit right in there, put them back in, test it before you put the thing back in, put a signal on the input of the transformer, measure the signal on the output transformer. If you have uh, a, uh, uh, an analog generator, you can sweep past it, you can watch the thing come up. And does that answer your question? Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> and I was curious if they should be a, uh, an issue because yeah. there's a signal I, loss somewhere. I, I've had some radios recently where both of them were bad. Lucky enough, I had the transformers. Uh, most recently, 
you can't find them anymore. So I had to take them apart. Uh, but I think the idea, I use this uh, a Dremel tool to burrow, yeah. and that just eats up the rivet. And the rivet falls out, and things fall out, and you just replace it. And the that's master. a particular yeah. issue with the 120? I, I think it's 120. Yeah. What, what you, again, uh, that's what my recollection, I had in my book, I think it's 120 puffs. But uh, there's also an interesting article, uh, after I did it, first of all, after I did it, then there was an article that came out in the Raven uh, talking about replacing, about doing the IF transformers. There's also an article on, uh, uh, on, on YouTube, I think, about doing that. Uh, but that, that's one interesting thing. The other thing, too, I, I'm going to mention, I, I'll get through some other failure mechanisms in the radio, too. But uh, get back to the power supply here. Uh, with this diode in there, typically nothing's going to happen to this diode. Uh, if you have a tube in there, then you know the tubes eventually are going to. Uh, yeah, yeah, these are the ones. Yeah, these are exactly. The ones. Is that roughly the diode transformer? Yeah, I'm not sure. That's my next. Well, again, you, you put the signal in. Put the signal into it, raise the output. Do both of them. You should be able to find it. So anyway, so uh, if you have this, in this radio, as I said, you have the, the diode. Uh, when these capacitors fail, uh, especially in, in the five tube radios, it's very easy to just bundle up uh, the, the three capacitors. I'll cut the can open, take all the stuff out of it, replace them with new capacitors, and use JB Weld to, 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 uh, to uh, epoxy that together. And you can, when it's all done, you cannot tell it's been done. It's just, it's just a perfect, perfect uh, uh, repair. Uh, the other thing too, in, in, in taking these components out, again, it's a personal preference. I like to use solder radio. All the terminals, suck all the solder out of the terminal, take out the old wire, put the new wire, in, mechanical connection, solder it, nice, nice connection. So when it's all done, it almost looks like it left a factory. If you, if you replace the capacitor that way, it looks like it left a factory. Okay. Uh, See, so I, I went briefly through this whole thing. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the failure mechanism, what, what typically goes wrong in the radio. And uh, what, uh, what I find is that uh, in so many of these radios, of course, you have the capacitors, and the capacitors, if you take this one, for instance, this is on the screen of this tube. When this capacitor starts to get leaky, what will happen is this series resistor will, will be, this capacitor will be drawing more current through that resistor. And then the resistors, uh, the half watt resistors, and you're, you're, you're dissipating more than the half watt, and the resistor values go up. So this resistor, rather than being, uh, let's see if I can read it. Rather than being, so this resistor, rather than being uh, 3.9 K, may go up to 5 or 6 K. As this voltage goes down on this tube, the gain on the tube goes down. So now the radio is not hearing very much. So people talk about recapping the radio. Well, that's part of the whole problem. Uh, but you also have to look at what you're checking these screen resistors. You got a screen resistor here, and uh, I guess in this radio, that's the only screen resistor. As the radios get more complicated, you have more and more stages on them, you may have three or four or five screen resistors in there, and you find out the capacitors are bad, and you got to look at all these, these series resistors in here. Uh, and let's see what other failures we're looking at. Uh, these coupling, this coupling capacitor here, too, uh, that. What, what happens is when this capacitor leaks, this voltage, this 68 volts here, will end up leaking through this capacitor and raising the bias on this tube so you get all sorts of audio distortion. Uh, I've seen so many cases in which this capacitor gets leaky and, and the audio is all distorted. The radio is running, it's hearing lots of nice signals, but it's, it's uh, it, 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 the, op the operating point of this uh, uh, tube is, is incorrect and therefore you get distortion. Uh, this capacitor here uh, at the uh, it, uh, uh, that bridges this, uh, this uh, cathode resistor, uh, these also leak too. You can almost guarantee that this particular capacitor is bad. And it's a nice small, and typically they're in a big package where you get this one and these four, and then it, 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 it's, it's easier in, in terms of repairing the radio to just replace this one capacitor and do those individually also. Let's see. Um, okay, uh, that's the one through 
through, through the schematic, I like to talk about injecting signals and determining what's, what, phase, what stage of this radio could be bad. I kind of went through a, a broad brush of different types of failures, but let's see what happens. If the radio doesn't work, if you go all the way back to here, and the radio doesn't work, and what I like to do is I like to cut the thing in half and say, well, let's see. Let's see if, let's see if the radio is working this side or if it's working that way. If you take the radio right here, and you take a signal and put it, a 455 kilohertz signal into there, and you get something out this end, then you know this much of the radio is bad, and if it's not working, then you have to go in this direction. And again, uh, typically you want to make sure that this, that this oscillator is working correctly. And what you do there is you go and you look at to make sure that this oscillator is working down here. And the way you do that is you as I said before, you take your radio, you take your regular 5-tube radio and tune, it, tune, this, tune this bad radio to 1 megahertz, 5,000 uh, kilohertz, and you take the other radio, no good radio, and listen for this signal at 1.455 megahertz. That way you can tell if this thing's working. Uh, beyond that, uh, you can look at the screen resistor here, you can look at the capacitor. A lot of these other resistors, if you take a look at the resistor on the grid at 407 kilo, 470K, uh, nothing's going to happen to that resistor. I'm not sure I've ever seen a bad 470K resistor. There's no, it's not, there's no power. It's just sitting there. It's sitting there with a uh, tenths of a volt, maybe a volt. So nothing's going to happen to that. So Jim, could you explain physically how you would use the two radios? Physically, how what? How you would use the two radios to... Oh, okay, all right, all right, okay, good, good, good point. Okay, so in order to determine if this is working at, this oscillator in here is working uh, at uh, 1.455 megahertz, you just take a, a known good radio, and wrap a little wire around it, and run the wire over by this radio, and see if this is putting out a signal. Because the signal is fairly strong, and if you put a little wire over it, and just try to receive, try to pick up and see if this is putting out a signal at 1.45 megahertz. That's how you do it. Is that clear? What are you wrapping it around on the other? Well, you could wrap it around. If it has a loop on the back of it, wrap it on the loop. If okay. it has an antenna, hook it in the antenna of the other the radio and just kind of wave it around here, uh, right, right around the uh, where the oscillator coils, coils would be. You should be able to hear it because it's a pretty strong signal. I, I end up using a... a, 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 a an analyzer to, to listen to this. I put a wire this. around a pipe, but I don't remember how I did it. You've done that before, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just wrapped it around a tube. Yeah, you do that, yeah. And yeah. I, but I can't remember even how, what I did after that. Well, well, you'll determine, my notes. the whole deal is to determine if this thing's working. Yeah, I, it did work. Yeah, well, there you go. That, that's how you determine if this thing's working. So, okay, so that, that's... I don't remember what I did. <laughs> okay, so, so what we decided is, is again, we determined radio was working this side, and we've had a problem here. Uh, you can have some problems in the, in the, uh, uh, the, the east, the, uh, you possibly can have some problems in here with all these coils and switches. Uh, on these switches, and all these radios are different, but uh, oxidation on the switches can be a real problem. I use a... Uh, it's an old-fashioned typewriter iteration. Now, people have various ideas on how to clean these switches. And I have found, personally, I like to I take a fine a typewriter eraser. It's got to be a soft rubber one and make a, like, like a point on it. And I can go through and I can clean all these little contacts on the switch. Other people want to hose it down with all these, these different types of uh, chemicals. And I like to save that as a last resort. Uh, if you have to use it, uh, Home Depot has a product called QT. And it's in the electrical supply area, and uh, it's a uh, it's a cleaning solvent. It's, it comes in a spray can, and it, uh, it it satisfies the three requirements, which is it can't be it can't be uh, uh, flammable, it can't uh, affect plastic, and it can't be oily. And if you satisfy all those, you can spray the stuff down. I don't like to use that stuff. I mean, that's an absolute last resort. These things can these switches can be taken care of by. If, if you determine there's a problem. The way you determine there's a problem is uh, if, you, if you have, if you have uh, if you're not receiving anything, you could take uh, a little antenna and put it onto this, right on the grid of this tube. And if you have a stronger signal here than you have out there, then you know there's a problem in here somewhere. And again, there's not much to go wrong. You have, you have the switches here, uh, and you have different bands you can work in too. So uh, this this whole thing, although it's, it looks pretty pretty uh, 
uh, complicated, it really isn't because there's not an awful lot going on there. Uh, okay, so so we, we determined, we already got the, this part of the, the receiver taken care of. Now what happens if if you put four fifty five for the it's gonna you have, you have to assume this is some type of test equipment that you have. Uh, and, and if you have something that can generate 455, I saw some 455 casing generators around there for 50 or 20 bucks. You could put a little signal in there to determine if this part's working. So if, uh, if this, uh, if it's not working here, again, let's go to the schematic here. Thank you. So the 455 will stop right here. Again, we have this issue of the IF transformers, and that's, that's a big one. Uh, if you can, if you can uh, determine it, I don't know, maybe you can do that or if you even do some uh, uh, further analysis on this thing. Again, uh, you could put a little 455 kilohertz signal into here because each of these have uh, be able to handle 455. You can put 455 KC in there and see if it goes that way. Uh, if it doesn't, then you know you have a problem somewhere in this whole chain. Uh, you could put audio, if you have an audio generator, you can put an audio signal into here and check that. There's almost nothing to go wrong in here other than the IF transformer. Uh, you have a capacitor in here, but the 10 mega ohm resistor would never go bad. This thing here, there's almost nothing on it, probably doesn't never go bad. Um, you have some, some very high value resistors here. That's a mica or ceramic, that's probably not going to have an issue. Um, so uh, again, uh, troubleshooting through this thing here, again with a, with a signal generator here, looking at the IF transformers, um, those are about the, uh, the failures. And making sure you have a good, good B plus supply. I suppose you could have a problem with the speaker, but I don't know the last time I ever had a problem with the speaker was. Uh, and you'd, you'd know right off the bat, you'd hear absolutely nothing. If this, if this, if this system were bad, you'd get absolutely nothing. I guess you could try the speaker, test it. You can test the speaker directly too. Yeah, well, you can test with an old meter. Exactly. You can check all yeah. sorts of different ways. Yeah, yeah. But uh, let's see. Any questions about this? I kind of went through it kind of fast. And uh, questions or comments or let's see what else we're going to talk about here. I was going to talk. I have some other notes here too. And. Uh, yeah, one of my bullets here of reminders was assume nothing. And uh, especially if you just buy a radio, you, you have no idea what, what condition the radio is. So uh, it's nice to bring this thing up on, on in a way that you don't put all the power in at the same time, like bring it up on a Variac. Uh, if I have a radio come in and someone just said they, it was working in their house, I wouldn't would bring it up on a Variac. But if you get this unknown radio from some unknown location that, with unknown condition, then it's nice to bring it up on a Variac. And if you bring the voltage up and you find out you're at 10 volts and you're already drawing three or four amps, then you know you're in big trouble. And you just better shut the thing down and go, go sort out and find where the problems are. And typically the problems would be in this area with uh, either shorter capacitors, uh, probably, probably shorter capacitors, shorter diode or something in that area. There's nothing up here. I don't think you can draw a sufficient amount of current. These are all limited by these resistors in here. So the prob prob problem will probably be in here. Um, finding, and I, my other door to find and review technical information. Uh, there's so much technical information available. Uh, we have, uh, for the S120, we have this one from the manufacturer, pretty good information. We have another example of an older radio from Riders, and in the Riders, they show the actual components, a drawing of the components in the radio, and all sorts of, I mean, there's just more information here you ever, ever want to have. So you can do the research there, you can find some on the internet, you can go to, um, um, the boat anchors uh, net, and, net, and they have all sorts of information on all sorts of radios, particularly helicraft. They probably have every helicraft in the world in, that, in the uh, uh, boat anchors uh, uh, website. Uh, careful, perform a careful visual observation. I found that I've spent a lot of time troubleshooting the radio all the way down, all of a sudden I found a bad component. If I had spent time looking at the radio, I would have found a bad component first by looking and not spending all my time with my test equipment. So the importance of a good visual examination on these radios is really, really important. Um, you really, just you spend that time, and also, uh, with these 5-tube radios, 
it's not so much you can learn from what's going on in the front, but you get more complicated radios and you can find that by playing around with the controls, you can learn maybe what part of the radio has a problem. Uh, playing with the band switch and find out does it work in one band and not in the other bands, but to get you right down to the switches. So uh, learn as much as you can from uh, actually putting hands on the radio, the volume control, and you know, doing as much as you can, touching the antenna, and, and learn as much as you can without even delving into the radio. Uh, and the other thing too, and I, I've found this many times, that does the radio agree with the schematic that modifications been solved the radio? I don't know how many radios I've found, particularly the amateur stuff. The radio comes in and you see this unknown circuit doing some unknown thing that nobody quite understands by the way it doesn't work. Well now what do you do? Well, I bring it all the way back to the way it was when it left the factory. And then you have a ch chance of fixing it. Otherwise, you don't know what the predecessor did. I had some radios that just ripped all the way down, bring all the way back to the way it left the factory, and it worked just fine. And people put in modifications to solve problems, but if they solve the problem in the first place, it wouldn't be a modification. Uh, use an isolation, Larry brought this up last, the last time I did thing, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned an isolation transformer, but uh, it's always a good idea to get yourself isolated from the mains because you've got this type of situation going on. So, good idea to do that. I learned the lesson the hard way too, and, and hopefully you'll learn that lesson yourself because you really want to keep this thing isolated from, uh, from the mains. Uh, logical troubleshooting, we kind of went through this logical troubleshooting from the block diagram, from the big picture view, trying to find out what stage we think the problem is in, and then going into here at the individual stage, looking at the various types of components that can cause the, the, the uh, radio to fail. So it's important to have a nice logical approach. And sometimes as you go through it, you get stumped, 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 and then what you have to say, well, I'm just going to set the thing aside and get it some other time. And uh, you know, the tubes, uh, tubes go without saying that uh, the failure is typically going to be in the tubes. The tubes are operating at high temperatures, they're hot, uh, and they're, they're eventually going to fail. So the tubes are a big, big source of problems with the uh, radio. Of course, the capacitors, the leak at the uh, electrolytics in the power supply, all the capacitors, this one here, uh, the decoupling capacitors, the other decoupling capacitor here. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, other capacitors that can, that can cause, uh, cause problems. Um, I find some of the uh, radios that we get in the 60s, rather than putting in the uh, uh, paper capacitor, put in ceramics. I like discs. I like the disc ceramics, particularly working around the IF. Uh, it's particularly more important to get up to 10.7 megahertz IF because you really want to have nice short beads on this capacitor. You don't have a capacitor that long, you can get one about that long. Uh, let's see, I think that, uh, oh, what we could do now, let, let's, if there are any more, if there are no questions on that, we could go to the... Uh, just a quick question yeah. on, the, on the power supply. Um, I'm just getting into this and kind okay. of new to it. I don't have a Variac, okay. but I'm going to build a Dimbo tester. Sure, that's good, yeah. Is that yeah. a good option to use? Yeah. yeah. Protect the radio as opposed to yeah. if you yeah. don't have a Variac? You, you want to have some way to limit the potential for high, in, high, in, in, high input current into this radio. You have, if you have some serious failure, it's probably not so much in something like this, but you get the more complicated radio with a power transformer and then the power transformer could be bad. You put you put cold voltage in there and then there's smoke and all sorts of other bad things. Uh, but it, it's a good idea to limit the input current here somehow, whether you do it with very accurate you do with the bulbs or, or whatever. Other questions or comments? Okay, uh, I the next thing we can do, and I'm not sure exactly how to do this because the radio is pretty small, but uh, if anybody's interested, we can go through and point out the capacitors. Uh, we can point out, well, the IF transform is pretty easy. We can go through and do a physical a match between the schematic and the, and the radio. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are interested, but if you want to, we can do that on an individual basis. It's kind of hard to do it uh, as, a, as a group. You can turn it around on the Okay. Yeah. Maybe you could bring on the, oh, can you put that down? Okay, yeah, but this radio dead. here, uh, this radio, this uh, tube here was the uh, oscillator, oscillator detector, which gets us back over to right here, convert 12 E6. And you can kind of get an idea that that's, the, that's a tube because it's very close to this, to this uh, these capacitor. This is the band spread capacitor, and that's the actual capacitor. I believe this is the oscillator, and that's the antenna. 
Uh, so this tube will work in conjunction with those capacitors and all these coils here to tune the input, to do this tuning here, and also to provide these circuits so the oscillator will operate at the right frequency to match the input frequency so you get 455 kilohertz out. Again, these are the infamous IF transformers. Uh, this is the IF amplifier tube, which is right here. Again, you know, look from the schematic, you got IF transformers on both sides, and you got the, the IF amplifier tube there. And lo and behold, you got two, and you got the two, two IF transformers in the tube here. This is the detector tube. Again, the detector tube goes right here. And then you have the, um, uh, the audio amplifier tube, it's a 50 C5 in this radio. And this is the uh, uh capacitor. On this one, I don't know how I would... See, the, the problem with, with some of these capacitors is, um, if you decide you're gonna put those capacitors underneath the chassis, you have the space. So I've worked on some that people jammed all those capacitors under the, under the chassis, and well, I can't do any more than there are those capacitors on it, so I end up putting a, a, uh, an upright capacitor like this in there so they have space to work underneath and by the way it looks like it's a pretty decent job. Uh, this one here, uh, I think I'd probably find a way to either refill this one or put in another metal capacitor in there uh, so that, and if you take a look underneath this thing, you see, you see how crowded that is right by that, by that transformer, by the capacitor. You see, if you're going to put some capacitors under there, it's going to be an interesting trick mm. right in there. That's the reason I like to rebuild these things. So, on the left of your picture of the um, schematic, yes. three transformers, where are they on that? Okay. These are, these are the transformers right here. The, the question is, the question is, you got these transformers, you got these transformers. Again, these are for the antenna, and these are for the oscillator, and they're right under here. So they're all over they're all there. The, and they're marked on this right, the, the top ones are the antenna. So these are the antenna ones, you got these for the antenna, and these are for the, uh, the oscillator. And they go through the switch, and if you, this switch, it's hard for me to see, this switch looks pretty good. Some of the switches, you, you look at the switch, and it's all black. Yeah. And it's all black. So at that point, you have, and people say that, that uh, silver oxide is a conductor. Well, I found that silver oxide is not a conductor. Uh, and what happens is you have this, uh, you have a, a silver plate with silver oxide on it, and you got the, the uh, connections trying to, and they, they don't make, a, they make a, a good connection. So again, I'd like to use an eraser to erase that stuff off. Now, if there's another product that can do that, I'd like to know what it is, but I haven't found it. But you've got to get the oxide off. And you can tell uh, sometimes, even with the band switch, you turn the band switch and it works in some bands and it doesn't work on other bands. And, and, and you, you twiddle a little bit and it works and it doesn't work well. You get in there and you clean the thing up. I think it detoxes, it doesn't work on what you're talking Well, yeah. I, I treat those things as kind of last resort. I really don't like to use the chemicals on it. Right. It leaves, especially, it, it, there's two different, times of, 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 two different types of uh, uh, deoxide. There's the clear stuff, it's a very clear liquid, and I will use that on a toothpick and try to clean the, clean the switches off. If I, if I can't get to it uh, using an eraser and actually physically remove the oxide, then I'll take a uh, uh, toothpick or some type of a long stick, and dip it in the, in the clear stuff, you use the clear stuff, and that wipes it off. Now the other stuff, the red stuff you put on there, and that, I, that's going to last forever. That is the stickiest, oiliest junk. I, I don't like to use that. Oil. I have some, but I tell you, I, I, I don't like to use it at all. That, that's an absolute resort. And I, I, that's a last resort, particularly for potentiometers. Uh, and I, these potentiometers, this one isn't too difficult. Uh, but what happens is, if this thing goes, if this thing gets flaky, let's say. So now you have a flaky, a flaky, uh, 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 potentiometer here, what are you going to do? Well, to me, I'd like to spray it with this QT stuff I get from, uh, from Home Depot. And sometimes that fixes the problem initially, and then two days later it might come back. And you spray it again. But if you keep doing that, and you're not going to fix the problem, 
then you may have to go to the last resort and I would use that sticky stuff, which I don't, don't like to use at all. But before I use that, and say now, if I use that, in this, this, this resistance uh, potential I'm going to go dead, now what am I going to do? I have to have a fallback. So I will put that in until I have a fallback. Because you know you have to get a two meg audio taper pot with a switch on it, with the right length shaft, with the right end on it, with all the other right stuff that you have to, and, and, and look at those odds, and I've got a bunch of them, but none of them ever seem to fit right. right. And then it's not long enough, so you have to make a coupling. You gotta make a coupling to put on there, and you gotta, it's just, so you have to be really, really careful. If you have a problem with one of these things, just be really, really careful, because you could end up digging a hole looking for a spare, spare radio or a spare part to get it. Have you ever taken them apart? I've seen some. I, I've taken, I, well, okay. That, good, that's a good point. I've taken them apart. I had one radio that came in, and the shaft was broken off. It was, it was, it was, a, uh, it was, a, it was a control. The shaft is totally broken off. Well, now what do I do? Well, what I was able to do is I had exactly the right part. I was able to, without unsoldering the wires, open the thing up, put the new thing on, put it all back together again. And you could not tell the radio had been worked on because nothing had been desoldered. So, I mean, that's the, that's the, the holy grail of solutions right there. It's when you can take it apart, put a new one on, and get it back together again. But there are so many different manufacturers, and, and the older these radios are, the harder it is to find those parts. Uh, you get, there's some vintage in there which, um, maybe it's the 60s or 70s where you can find this stuff. I buy some stuff from the Circle Sales in Nebraska sometime, and uh, uh, they have, typically the prices are pretty high, but on some of these older components, they've got tons of them there. They're almost giving the stuff away. So I've been able to get some, some uh, uh, resistors, uh, various potentiometers from them, uh, but you really have to be careful working around these switches. It's just, it sounds like a simple thing, you know, you got a bad switch or you got a bad, but you know, the switch goes bad. Sometimes you can just replace the switch. Uh, you take it apart and, and undo the switch, put the new switch on, careful how to align it, and you solve the problem. That, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. So, uh, let's see. So, what are we talking about here? Um, of course, these are the bottoms of the uh, IF transformers. Uh, someone has already can't tell if these have, no, these have not, not, not been replaced. Looks like these are the original capacitors in there. And these are black beauty capacitors in there. And, and typically, they have a very bad reputation because they get leaky. And, and, uh, I, I do have some brand new, new old stock black beauties that are okay. I wouldn't use them anywhere. They're just kind of around. Um, and I, I personally like to go with the orange drop capacitors, but I'm, for a whole bunch of different reasons. But uh, I know Joe sells some lot of capacitors and, and uh, the yellow ones, and they work fine in some of these radios. And, uh, repairing some of these radios, too. Uh, when you get into repairing these radios and doing tubes and capacitors and a couple of IF transformers and maybe you got a bad output transformer, and after a while you say, you know, we double the cost of the radio, and uh, we end up with the radio to worth half what you put into it. And you know, there's all those types of trade-offs you have to, have to make. And I, I treat a lot of this repair as a, as an act of love almost, we should like the radio. We should like the radio, should we do it? A lot of these radios come in, I ask people, uh, do you have any sentimental value associated with this radio? And if you do, then you're gonna have to fix it. If it's just something, another thing you wanna have hanging around, it's gonna cost you twice the thing, twice the cost to rebuild the thing because of all the stuff you have to do. The tubes aren't getting any cheaper. It's no fun doing the IF transformers. If you can find a replacement IF transformer, you gotta do the capacitors and all of that. It's just, it's just almost an endless deal. The good thing about the 5 tube radios is there's not a bunch of stuff that can go on. As these radios get bigger, you'll end up putting 20, 18 to 20 capacitors into it and a handful of resistors and you've got the tubes. And after a while, the, the, the cost of repair of these things just gets absolutely astronomical. So, um, I don't know if we can see the diode in here. Uh, yeah, here it is. Right? It's a selenium. Oh, uh, that's another thing too. The selenium rectifiers, uh, they kind of have a bad reputation too because uh, when they go bad, they, they make this funny uh, funny smell. And I've had some of them have gone bad that way. Um, uh, in replacing the seleniums, uh, there's a series resistor you put in there. You can look up on the internet what it should be. It's typically around 100 ohms or so uh, because you want to reduce the surge through this, uh, through this particular uh, to, this, uh, to this diode. If you replace it with a, with a, uh, with a uh, silicon diode, you want to put a series of system in there. Now this already has a 33 ohm. That's pro that probably would be okay. You'll probably just put a, uh, uh, 
uh, Sony Vern uh, Sony a uh, regular Sony diode in here as opposed to Sony. Um, so what else can we point out here? I think we're probably uh, probably getting down to again these are screen bypass capacitors are in here. Uh, so I guess if you're going to replace it, you probably want to do at least these three, or maybe a total of five, five or six, five or six capacitors. Uh, also, a lot of people just get the rating they want to uh, want to recap the thing, and I think what you really have to do is determine uh, the condition of the radio, and is the fault of the radio due to capacitors, or is it due to something else? Is it due to whatever else in the radio? It could be. I don't know, some other problem someplace in here. So you really want to, I think people have to think about it and go through some type of logical troubleshooting to determine you should do that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a factor in, in comparing these things that becomes more of a factor when you have bigger radios with more capacitors and more stuff in it. Uh, some radios I found the capacitors don't have to be replaced, as old as they are. Some radios that are really old don't have that capacitor replaced. If they have uh, disk capacitors, you, don't want to replace those at all. I'm not sure I've seen, I may have seen one bad disc capacitor in everything I've ever done. And so the odds of finding a bad disc capacitor are pretty, pretty low. Well, what year is this for you? Uh, well, let's see. It should say right on here. I would guess it's uh, 60 something. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I would guess, uh, Mark, what do you think? What year? It's probably the 1960s. 60s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim, <clears throat> would do you recommend an inline capacitive tester? Any certain brands, or do you use one? Well, okay, I use a Sencor. Uh, I like the Sencor because Sencor is a company that made test equipment for people who care radios. That was their main, I mean, for, for service people. Uh, can you check the capacitor in line? Now I'd say typically no. Uh, you could almost infer capacitors bad by looking at this this right here. You look at this screen resistor here, this screen resistor that you know that that's bad. Because the only way that's going bad is you're going through this car that's being drawn through this capacitor. Uh, again, to answer your question specific, I'd like the Sencor. Uh, Sencor is, is, a, is probably more expensive, but you punch the button, you get the value, plus you get the dissipation effect. You can tell the leakage of the capacitor. Plus it has the other side that does inductors. You can raise the value of the inductor and you can raise the dissipation factor of the inductor. Now, the newer ones have a button for ESR too. So, uh, to answer your question specifically, I like the send course. Uh, I Thank did you. use for many years before I bought, before I had the send course, I used the ICO with the iTube in it. And you know, there are lots of different, different pieces of test equipment you can use and depending on how much you want to spend on this test equipment, how deeply are you into this whole thing, you know, you can get into it a little bit and you can get into it a lot. And if you get into a lot, then you end up with all the high-end test equipment because it makes life so easy. It's just, it's just so easy. And probably the piece of equipment that I use the most is a capacitance checker. I mean, that's, I, I had three of them, the same ones, because if one failed, I wanted to make sure I had it. I, was, I can't live without it. They have to have it, so. More questions? <coughs> can't be any more. Go ahead, I'll go ahead. Before you have all that test equipment. Yeah, yeah, um, okay, good. good. Say, <laughs> say you have a recap radio and you're, you're not satisfied with the tuning and like I've got a, a Zenith Transoceanic. And when I go up like on the broadcast, there's a little zone where I can get some stations in and then outside of that, it's just all noise. Um, what would that tell you? What would you start looking at? Well, okay, let me talk about this a little bit. Um, part of the reason I, I'm, I'm not too keen on working in a lot of these, these radios is they don't identify what the, select, what the sensitivity of this radio is. So you finish with the radio, you hook up your antenna, and you say, I think it's working okay. Well, how do you know it's working? Well, we see a lot of stations. Is there enough station? I don't know. In a half a microvolt of a signal here, I should get something out of here. Now, if I do that, if I put in a half a microvolt here and I get that out, I know the radio is working fine. If I have to put in six microvolts into here, and I'm getting this, then I go something down with the radio, I'll go fix it. So when I'm all fixed, when, when, when I think I'm all done fixing the radio, and it meets a specification, I say the radio's working fine. 
Now you get a hold of this thing here, and they don't tell you what the sensitivity is. So how do I know if the radio's working right? Well, I really don't. Well, after a while, people kind of get the idea, well, if you put this kind of antenna, I can hear the station in New York or whatever. You know, I mean, that's a good test, but I'm a numbers guy. I'm an engineer, so I'm interested in, you know, I want to know how many microvolts I want to put in here to really get out of here. And I want a block diagram that tells me if I put a microvolt into here, what do I get out of here? And if I put a signal in here, what do I get out of here? Uh, and to answer your question, how do you know if it's running right? Those Zenith transoceanics are incredibly, if they're running properly, they're incredibly powerful. Uh, Mark picked up one uh, at an antique show many, many years ago and uh, had to be, had to recap two tubes and everybody had it on the bench and it was all taken apart. And I plugged the thing in, I'm getting stations from Europe. The thing's on my, on my workbench with no antenna on it, I'm getting stations from Europe. I think it's running pretty good. Mm. So, but again, I, was I sure? No, because I don't have, I don't know how many microvolts I got to put it in the front end of it. Um, I don't know how to answer your question other than, um, I, I, would, I would expect if I put around a microvolt or salt into this, it should be okay. Uh, what drives the sensitivity in most cases of these, these radios is the IF amplifiers. If you, if you put your finger, or put, uh, to, I shouldn't say that you get up electric, <laughs> but if you take a wire, a wire, an insulated wire with a probe on it, and put it right at the input of this IF amplifier, I mean, you should hear also, I mean, you should, be able to hear the noise come up, and so this is what's going to drive the whole whole radio. Here. And for, I don't know how Zenith did it. You know, Zenith transoceanics, but they're incredibly sensitive. Those vacuum tube radios are just they're just. I don't think it would be any better. I don't know how they, I, I don't know how they did it. It's just you don't think it has anything to do with alignment, do you? Well, it, it can. not Yeah, I, I've I've seen that too. We had uh, we went to one flea market once, and a guy came by and had the Zenith there, and uh, I took the thing home and. Uh, I think I had one tube I replaced, but I did the alignment. The alignment just incredible, incredibly uh, in increased the performance of the radio. Yeah. So that's a good point. It could be aligned. And I haven't, I haven't even touched on alignment. You know, there's so many facets of what you do to get the... I'm interested in trying to get the thing going. The way I work on it, I want to get the thing going so that it's, it's receiving about right, and then I'll go through and run all the alignments. Uh, and, and, and that said, even sometimes I get the radio through and I'll just do a preliminary, a preliminary brush through all the alignments to see if they're about right. Uh, because again, when the radio comes in, you don't know if somebody went through and tightened up all the screws in the, oh, the radio. Really so now, 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 all the, now, now everything's out of whack. Now you've got to start from scratch. Yeah. I got one station and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so who was it who had the transoceanic with probe? Paul, okay. Yeah. It's always risky to troubleshoot a radio remotely. But, <laughs> oh, come on, Larry, come on. But, but you, you said there's part of the span of the dial where it's quiet, like you hear nothing, and then you hear noise on either side, right? Right. Does it do that on all the bands? Um, some more than others. I, I, <laughs> I'd, I'd have to check. <laughs> if it does it on all the bands, the first thing I would think of, not that it has to be this, but the first thing that I would think of is the variable capacitor yeah. is shorting out yeah. in that particular the band, part of the band where you hear nothing, and it could be But It's more like short I, I hear it, it performs normal, what I would consider normal. Oh, normal. And then outside that, it's, it's just noisy. loud. Okay. Just static. Loud. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it could be, it could be that it's shorting as you're turning it. Out. Okay. Is it loud when you're turning it, or just when you're turning the the tuning knob, or is it loud when you're just just sitting there? I believe when you when I tune out, yeah. if I stop, it, it continues with okay. just the static right. noise. Is it is this scratchiness that you're hearing, or is this just atmospheric noise? If it's scratchiness, I'll go along with what Larry said. Yeah. If it's Check if it's not scratch, because if those if those capacitors plates are touching, you're going to hear some scratch. You're going to hear yeah. right. a yeah. lot of static dust or whatever could be, and dust alone could contribute. You know, dust and other debris in there, you know, or any bent bent plates or anything. It could be possibly. Um, yeah. I'll take a look at that. It could be the alignment too. I don't think it could be alignment. Yeah. Yeah. But why yeah. would it? Why would a misaligned radio get noisy? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I think it's something to check, though. I think yeah. you got to oh, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I, again, I wouldn't start tweaking until you make you make sure everything else is yeah. good first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so there are a number of different approaches to take on it, and uh, 
I get, this ties back into the visual observation of radio too. You know, uh, I had one uh, one situation where somebody decided to put some uh, spray in the capacitors, and uh, I looked in there and I said, "What is that?" And some the fluid was still in there, so yeah, I had to blow all that with compressed air. So uh, a visual observation can maybe tell you something about that. Hard to say. It's hard. Just like Larry said, it's hard to talk about these things without getting in there because. What you describe doesn't necessarily enter into my head what you're thinking. And I've seen that happen. <laughs> I, used to, I used to help people with televisions, and they'd give me a description on television. I'd say, oh, okay, when I saw, finally saw the television, that, that isn't what, what it's, it didn't, didn't come across. And it's difficult to describe some of these conditions with noise and static, and it's good in one place and bad in another. And, uh, so it's, it, it's uh, it can, it, as Larry said, it can be very difficult to use very well. Yeah, I, I haven't thoroughly analyzed it, I, so I'm yeah. just giving you my impressions of what I thought. Yeah. So what have you done on the radio so far? I actually, I'm brand new to the hobby, okay. and I had somebody else, I asked them just to recap it, and okay. they recapped it, a professional. Yeah. Um, but I, I was expecting it to be very sensitive, and I'm a little underwhelmed with it, and so I think it's something else. Oh, you don't know how many times I've heard this story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, I got a radio with, anyway, I'm not going to talk about it, so. <laughs> But it's always interesting to go back and try to redo somebody else's work, and uh, it's uh, not always a fun, fun job. Questions or comments, or uh, what, could, what can we do better or different, or more in depth, or less in depth, or what? Mm. I think it's a good start. But Send us your email for questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I'll give you my email. Yeah, I, I get all these questions. All, I get people calling all the time. You know, even during the shows, people come by. Well, I get this radio. It doesn't do this. And so yeah, I'm actually, I actually uh, bother around with finger all the time when I get get stumped. Yeah. Well, like, well, you know, people don't mind that. You know, we yeah. kind of pass the information along somehow or another. Ray Bentham was a really good one uh, on his books. Uh, yeah. He put together an awful lot of books. I don't know how he did it. His books went on and with pictures and all sorts of information on them. Yeah, Alan had me buy a couple of his books. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ray's books were really, really good. Uh, Especially for Philco. Oh, for Philco. I guess so. And he's got the book on ballast, ballast uh, tubes and uh, belts and uh, he did everything. Just oh, it's detailed. Incredible guy. Well, if there are no further comments, feel free to come up and talk about more about this stuff. Or uh, if you have any recommendations, what we can do differently next time, we'd like to like to do it. Just trying to find is a way to get this. Isolation these. transformer you got over there, Jim? That is, yeah. Okay. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. This is this is this is the prop. Uh, well, everybody knows what, I, what the uh, isolation transformers look like. That happens to be uh, about a hundred watt one. Uh, yeah, it's always a good idea to use one with these. All American five radios, anything without a power transformer, because uh, otherwise it could get into trouble. Say you have a signal generator, you always want to connect the ground lead to the chassis. Well, in a radio like this, the, the chassis could be hot with 120 volt AC, and it's going to be very exciting when yeah. you put the signal generator ground up to the chassis if yeah. it's plugged in one way versus the other way. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's this connection right here. Yeah. So. I have a related question. If you use an isolation transformer on your A85, can you put your test equipment on the isolation transformer also, like your signals and other or your stoves? Well, if, if the, pur the purpose of the isolation transformer is to isolate yourself from the main, so you don't care. I mean, this, this may as well be in, in Mars somewhere. Once you, once you go past the isolation transformer, all bets are off. You're not connected to anything. So Because of those windings, you're isolated. But, so where do you put the... We don't have a chassis here. Hmm? No, I think Bob's question is, do you run the uh, test equipment through the isolation transformer That's as well? Asking, yeah. Okay, and or just the radio, or the radio and your signal generator or the skull. Well, most most test equipment has a power transformer. Anything good would. I, I doubt. I, I know, Jim. Have you ever seen any signal generator that uses? that's run directly up the line without a transformer? No. I, I haven't either, so generally in those cases, the isolation transformer would be totally unnecessary for the test equipment. If someone, you know, neither Jim and I are, know of every piece of test equipment that was ever made, so 
we can't, it's a negative proof. We can't say one was never made that doesn't have a power so transformer. So is there a downside to running it off the isolation transformer? Uh, as long as the isolation transformer can supply the required power, uh, I don't see that. Yeah, but it, I guess, but if you go all the way back, if this is isolated from the main, so this does, this has no, no relationship to anything else in the world, then you can hook a test equipment breaker up with the chassis, right? Right? Yeah. Well, the I thing, think, is, the thing the is, is if you say, for argument's purposes, some company made a low-end signal generator that ran directly off the mains without a transformer yeah. too, then you have a, a lead you think is grounded that may be hot with AC, yeah. in which case it's not a very good idea, even if that is the radio you're working on is isolated. Yeah, that, yeah that's a possibility. Because yeah. you'll, you'll make your chassis hot. And then if you touch the chassis, yeah. Yeah. Right. you're in so, trouble. So, I mean, this is all theoretical because we're talking about what could be yeah. rather than what is, but if you want to be totally safe and you don't know what's in yeah. your test equipment, Run it through the isolation transformer as well. Yeah. What about a, uh, a dim bulb? A what? A dim bulb. If you were using a dim bulb instead of the variac, where would that go? Wait in line, wait in gear, in series with the line. In, in series, series, so. Yeah. 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 That's my preferred method, by the way, the dim bulb. Yeah. yeah. I like to crank up. With the variac, I've got this, uh, it's made by. I think it's made by Variac. It's actually the Variac on it. It's got a voltmeter and a uh, power meter. So if I crank it up, if I'm at 10 volts and I'm drawing an amp, I know I'm in big trouble. I got to shut the thing down and go find out what the problem is. But that, that's a little bit more uh, uh, specific, and, and you can really know what the numbers are there. But the dim bulbs, anything. If you put anything in series with this thing to limit, the idea is to just limit the current. It limit the current. So if you don't know what the condition is, limit the current so you don't get into trouble and have a fire or a smoke or whatever. Right. Or, or in the case of a radio power transformer, you say yeah. you could have uh, shorted electrolytics and you plug it in and you waste your power transformer and at that point the radio is probably not worth fixing. Yeah, yeah this happened to Mark and I. We had a uh, Collins radio and uh, that's exactly what happened. We didn't put a, uh, a very, didn't run on a very, we got it from, we knew, we knew the person, we got it from the person, plugged the thing in and it was, smoke because what had happened is there was a, I forget it was a shorted diode or a shorted uh, capacitor, but it uh, took out the power transformer, smoked it out of the power. In fact, I still have a power transformer for 75 S3B around in case anybody needs one because one burned out in one of the radios we had. So, yeah, you could cause, cause a lot of damage, especially if you have a power transformer. If you don't have a power transformer, you just, it, it's, just a, it's just a good thing to do anyway. Any other further questions or comments or? It's been a good discussion. A lot, a lot of interesting points came up. Yeah, I've got one sure. more. Yep. And, and again, feel free to edit out my stupid questions. But uh, <laughs> on uh, older radios, and I'm getting this watching YouTube videos and stuff, I've heard sometimes where uh, you have to have the speaker connected or you can cause some damage. And I've yet to find any elaboration on, on well, that. Well, uh, I think most of these, uh, this one doesn't have it. Uh, Can you talk more about now the older radios? If they had the plug in and you disconnect the plug, then you're going to disconnect the B plus on the tube, and it's not going to cause any problems. If you don't have a speaker hooked up to this thing, uh, typically they put a resistor in here, so if there is some load, the speaker comes off. But you can't disconnect the speaker on this thing anyway. So uh, I, 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 many times I, I've operated a radio without a speaker, and I haven't had any damage to it. Now I haven't run it for 12 days that way, maximum volume. But if I turn the thing on and there's no, there's nothing coming out of the radio, I forgot to hook the speaker up, put the speaker up. I don't, I don't think it would cause any real damage on it, uh, especially for any extended period, if you don't do it for any extended period of time. I, can I add something to sure. that? I so, think where that advice came from is in some of these older radios, the output transformer was mounted on the speaker. Right. Okay. So a lot of them actually. Yeah. And if you disconnect the speaker, you have voltage going to the screen grid of the audio output tube and not to the plate. That's oh, yeah. going to cause the screen grid to, to draw a lot like more current yeah, yeah. than it should.